Go back with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. A man named Arthur Pink pointed out for us that there are four books in this Bible that deal with the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we know what they are. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Four books. But what he pointed out was that each one of those books portrays our Lord in a different light. Totally different light. You know, we think these stories are repeated, just repeated. Sometimes we think, well, it's because of the mouth of two or three witnesses. And that's true. You know, you'll have a story here and then it's in two of them or three of them or four of them. But each one of these portrays our Lord in a different light. We get to see Him from four different angles as He is, who He is. His attributes and His character in his person. Matthew portrays our Lord as the son of David, heir to the throne. That's who he is. Those wise men came and said, where is he that's born king? King of the Jews. Mark shows us the servant, the servant of God, God's workman and his work. Luke brings out the humanity of our Lord, the man. It shows us the man. It shows him to be the perfect man, the opposite of sinful man. And John shows us his deity. John shows us that he is God. God come down. Have we not seen that as we've been going through John? You know, we've been going through John now since we... Um, really since I got here. We almost immediately went into John. And we have seen as we go through that book that this is God. I mean, this is God Himself. God come down. Equal with His Father, God Almighty. Now, all four of those characteristics are in all four books. Every one of them. We see that in all four books. But the the theme of Matthew is the king. The theme of Mark is the servant. The theme of Luke is the man. And the theme of John is the God. Well, in Isaiah 42, God the Father said, Behold my servant, didn't he? Behold my servant. And by God's grace, I pray that's exactly what we do this morning. I want to behold his servant. Verse 1, this is going to be our text. Mark 1, verse 1. It says, the beginning of the gospel. That's a pretty good place to start, isn't it? The beginning of the gospel. When did the gospel begin? When did this gospel begin? Go with me over to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is the everlasting gospel. The Apostle Paul told Titus about the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the foundation of the world, didn't He? Before the foundation. The Lamb has been slain from the foundation of the world. But if you want to get to the heart of the matter, if you want to get to the heart of the answer, the gospel began when Jesus Christ came. It began when Jesus Christ came. Go with me back to Mark chapter 1. Mark 1 
Verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is all about Christ. The gospel is concerning Christ. I hope that the Lord causes a sinner to finally get a hold one day of the simplicity of Christ. I hope He calls another sinner to come to the realization that the gospel is concerning Christ. We take that statement for granted. And here's why I say that. We completely take that statement for granted. My father was in religion, just like most everybody. He was in Southern Baptist religion. And he thought he knew something about God. He thought he was a pastor of a church. He thought he knew something about the Scripture, the Word, the Gospel. But God crossed his path with a gospel preacher. He crossed his path with the gospel message. And my dad said, here's what the man said. Here's a statement the man made. And I'll tell you who it was. It was Darwin Pruitt. He made the statement, the gospel is concerning Christ. And Dad said, as soon as he said that, the light came on. The gospel is all about Jesus Christ. If we're not talking about Christ, we're not talking about the gospel. And I'm hoping to show us that for just a few seconds and then we'll close, okay? We are not talking about the gospel if we're not talking about Jesus Christ. The gospel is concerning Jesus Christ. Here we are in the New Testament. God gave us this New Testament. This New Testament is 100% all about Jesus Christ. 100%. The Old Testament. We had that before we had the New Testament. Every word of it is all about Jesus Christ. I want to give us an overview of that. All right? Don't turn. Back in Genesis, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. We know that, don't we? <clears throat> they sinned in the garden. In that sin, every man in Adam has died, right? Well, back then in the garden, God told them. He declared to them. He made a statement to them. And what He was doing is He was preaching to them. He preached to them about the woman's seed. There's going to be a woman. You've sinned, but there's going to be a woman's seed. The serpent brought sin to man. But he said, the woman's seed is going to crush that serpent. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Okay, you've sinned, and you're going to die, and you're about to see in all those beautiful roses, thorns come out. And all those animals are going to start biting each other. And killing each other. And all those bugs are going to start biting you. And Adam, you're going to get angry with Eve for the first time in your life. And Eve, you're going to now have children and it's going to be extremely painful. It would have been nothing. Absolute joy. But sin has come. But there's a woman's seed that's coming. And he's going to take care of all of this sin. He's going to crush the head of the serpent. Now that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That angel told Mary whenever he came and it was time, he told Mary, you're going to have a son. And she said, how is that possible? See, and I've never known a man. He said, this son is not coming by corruptible seed. This son is not coming through sinful man. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. 
incorruptible seed, the woman's seed. He preached the gospel to them. That's what he did. All right, then a little later in Genesis, God said, Noah, build an ark. Everything inside that ark is going to be saved. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, we all know that because of God's mercy to us, that that's Christ, right? We know that's Christ. Everything outside of that ark was going to suffer judgment and damnation. That's not the gospel. And that's the truth. We tell men the truth. But there's no good news in that. Oh, we're going to be so happy today. We heard God's going to judge us. No, there's no good news in that. All of the good news is inside the ark. So we have the truth, but without Christ, we don't have the gospel. You can hear a man stand up there in hell, fire, and brimstone. Yeah, that's true. But I haven't heard the gospel yet. The gospel's inside Christ. There's some good news inside that ark. All right, now Exodus. Exodus is about a massive number of God's chosen people who are leaving bondage. It's an exodus. And it's about God sending His deliverer, right? To deliver His people out of the clutches of their captor. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Who is that deliverer? Moses. No, Jesus Christ. He said, Moses was talking about me. Moses wrote of me. All right, what was the means that God used to deliver them? How did He deliver them? He said, I'm coming through tonight and I'm killing everything. I'm killing the firstborn in all the land. But He provided for them a Passover lamb. And He said, when I see that blood, I will pass over you. That's the gospel. I'm killing everything. That's the truth. But here's a lamb. That's the gospel. I will not kill you because of that lamb. Who is the lamb? Jesus Christ. Leviticus tells us about the great atonement. That's what it keeps talking about. This great atonement. The only thing that will appease God concerning our sin. Look at this one. Turn over to Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. I've given you some blood. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now if you have a margin in your Bible, next to it is the blood, mine says, Hebrews 9.22. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9.22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. No remission. Whose blood? Well, that's the gospel. Look at verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle... Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not my blood. 
It's not your blood. It's not the blood of bulls and goats. A lamb cannot do anything for us. An actual lamb. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's lamb. All right, numbers. You don't have to turn to numbers. The book of Numbers tells us about these serpents that were biting the people, <coughs> killing the people. So Moses made a brass serpent and he put it on a pole and he lifted it up in the wilderness. Our Lord said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He said, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's the gospel. If they look, they'll live. Everybody's dying. But if you look to that serpent hanging on that pole, you'll live. That serpent was Jesus Christ. Why a serpent? The reason is because Christ became the very thing that was killing His people. Sin was killing us. So He made Himself to be sin. Deuteronomy. That book tells us about a city of refuge. A city of refuge. If anyone has sinned, there's a place you can run to. And as long as you're in that place, you will be safe. You'll live. You'll be spared. You know where that place is? You have any idea? That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is always in Jesus Christ. I was studying this, writing all this down, and I, I started thinking about that city of re refuge. <clears throat> I had a few thoughts uh, go through my mind, and I want to tell you what they are. I had a little domino of thoughts, and uh, I want to tell you about them. The first one is, I thought, it's amazing that they would make a place like that. The Lord laid it on their sinful hearts to create a place like that to show us Christ. But is it not amazing that there would even be a place like that in existence where lawbreakers and prisoners who had done all this evil could run to and just be safe? Is that not amazing? And then I immediately thought of prisoners telling other prisoners about this place. Escaped convicts. Running from the law. You know, the, the, the good and perfect law. The law is right. They're evil. Running for their life. I pictured them in a dark back alley. Scared. Whispering to each other, I know of a place where we can go. If we can just get to this place, we will be fine. We'll be safe. And uh, then I thought that city had to be plumb full of the worst of the worst. Right? If you, knew of, if you were in that case and you knew of a place where you could be totally safe, it had to be completely full of the vilest of the vile. And then I thought, I would not want to be in that place. Would you? I wouldn't want to go there. Murderers, thieves, horrible, horrible, wicked sinners. I wouldn't want to go there. And then I thought, I know why I wouldn't want to go there. It's because I have never been convicted by the law. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying? I have never been a prisoner in a cell. Never. I have never stood before judge and been sentenced to death, ever. I've never been on death row. So, 
I have no need of that city. I'm fine where I am, thank you. I, that city means nothing to me. But if I was a transgressor, if I was ever made to see that I am a true sinner, that city would be life to me. It would be life to me. The truth tells me you are that sinner. The gospel tells me there is a city. There is a city, a place of safety. Are there any sinners in here this morning? I know of a city. The scripture says it's a walled city. It's a fortress of safety. Here's where the gospel begins. It begins with sinners. This gospel is for sinners. That city is for sinners. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's the gospel. Joshua. Now, we're not going through all 66 books, I promise. Joshua has a precious story in it. Man, I love this story. It's about two spies that go into Jericho. And they end up making a covenant with a harlot named Rahab. I can't wait to meet that precious woman. I love her. But they make this covenant... And uh, they told her, you take this scarlet line and you put it in your window. And we're coming through. We're going to destroy this city. And when we see that red in your window, we're going to pass over you. We're going to pass over everything that's in your house. Well, isn't that the same gospel that's back in Exodus? Yes, it is. The gospel. That line is Jesus Christ. Judges talks about the angel of the Lord. Who's that? You know what the book of Ruth is about? It's about the kinsman redeemer. I thought Ruth was about Ruth. No, nope, it's about Boaz. Who is Boaz? He's Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer, the servant of God. Samuel talks about covenant mercy. You know where that's found? You know where a, a promise is found? There's been, a promise has been made. You know where it's been made? In Jesus Christ. God the Father, let me tell you something. This is something I'm so thankful for. I can't tell you how thankful I am for this. God the Father did not make a covenant with me. He made it with Christ. He said, if you will, I will. And he never looked at me and he never looked at you and said, if you will, I will. He looked to Christ and he said, if you will, I will. And then he shoved all of us in Christ. Kings tells us about a greater than Solomon. Chronicles is about the one who brought back God's ark. Ezra is about the one who defended God's law. Shall he not do right? Nehemiah is about the one who restored God's city. That whole book is about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Rebuilding the city. It's all about the one who restored God's city. Esther is all about the one who provided for God's people. Job talks about my Redeemer. The Psalms talk about my shepherd. Proverbs is about my wisdom. Ecclesiastes is about the only thing that truly satisfies. Song of Solomon is about my bridegroom. The whole thing is about my bridegroom. Isaiah is about my substitute. He was wounded for my transgressions. Jeremiah is about the great physician. Are you sick? Oh, there's a great physician. Lamentations is about the sufferer. Our Lord said, I am the man that has seen affliction. Ezekiel is about the glory of the Lord. Daniel is about the beloved. Hosea is about, is about the only Savior. Joel is about 
His Spirit in us. Christ in us. Amos is about God's standard. You know what God's standard is? You know what God requires? Just look at Jesus Christ. He said, I'm well pleased. Well pleased with my son. Obadiah tells us about God's deliverer. Jonah tells us that salvation is of the Lord. Micah tells us about an infant that's going to be born in Bethlehem. wonder who that is. Nahum talks about our comforter. Habakkuk talks about our strength. Zephaniah talks about the mighty one. Haggai talks about the desire of all nations. Zechariah talks about our foundation and our headstone. And Malachi talks about God's messenger who will prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. Here it is. Back in Genesis, we started it, and we started talking about him and talking about him and talking about him. And when Malachi got here, he said, a messenger's coming. Here he comes. The beginning of the gospel. The beginning of the gospel. All of that Old Testament was pointing to Jesus Christ. All of that New Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ. The beginning of the gospel is Jesus Christ. That's where we start. Every text in this scripture has a road that leads to Jesus Christ. Our job is to find that road and get on it. I love that. All right, Mark 1. Go with me back to Mark 1. Verse 1 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What does it mean that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's the beginning of the gospel. Only God could accomplish the work that God required. Only God. To say Jesus Christ is the Son of God is to say that God Almighty made Himself to be the servant. That's what it means. It means God Almighty made Himself of no reputation and took upon Himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here's what it means. Everything that God required, God provided in Himself. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you come to Christ, you will not be coming to the one who can get you to God. You'll be coming to God Himself. It means your judge is also your deliverer. The one who set the price is the one who paid the price. That's what it means. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's good news is what it is. It's good news. It's the beginning of the gospel. Here's our gospel. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The one that God put us in. The one that all of our hope is in. The one that all of our trust is in. The only one we have just so happens to be the Son of God. Good news. All right, let's stand together.